So welcome. We are thrilled. It's been a long time getting here. We're thrilled to welcome you as an audience. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Eric Gordon, uh, ninth grade English teacher at Credo. And yes, and I'm uh, Mix Lannan or Alex Lannan, also a ninth grade English teacher here at Credo. And I want to formally welcome you to tonight's performance called The Human Element. Um, we're just beyond excited. Um, it's been a long time coming. We're going to give you a little bit of background on the project and then introduce the student performers. Um, we'll also have some time at the end of the show to do a Q&A. Our total run time should be about less than an hour and 15 minutes. So a bit about the process, um, as the students can We'll tell you, they'll probably remember, back in February, the entire freshman class at Credo High School plunged into the world of artificial intelligence, setting out to learn about all of these emerging technologies and how they work and how they're changing the world. And this is also to document a moment in history, um, what some are calling, you know, perhaps hyperbolically, uh, our Promethean moment with technology. So following a tradition of documentary theater, students located an expert, someone out in the world that could speak to on a specific topic about AI that they found compelling. Then they conducted some interviews, gathered and recording their stories. Throughout this really you know, slow and deliberate process, uh, the students then transcribed, edited, and eventually turned their interviews into verbatim monologues. What that means is the characters that you're gonna to meet tonight are real people. The script is nonfiction, it's actual verbatim words of roboticists, biologists, doctors, and cybersecurity experts, teachers, artists, designers. And we even have a woman who specializes in uh, advising companies on the ethics of AI. And you might be someone who was interviewed. So one question that seems uh, important that probably a number of you are thinking to yourselves is why artificial intelligence? Um, so first, as a, a public Waldorf school, Credo supports students to explore technologies and through a critical lens by examining the potential benefits and drawbacks of specific technologies Students develop an ability to ask essential questions about how various aspects can positively or negatively impact their lives. This critical approach not only for, uh, fosters a deep understanding of the role of technology in society, but also equips students with the skills to become responsible and thoughtful consumers, ultimately making informed decisions. So to the second part of the question, why AI? Well, I mean, Mix Lannan said the Promethean moment, and there is, there's much extreme talk, there's hyperbole in all of this, but artificial intelligence, especially ChatGPT and the recently large, launched uh, large language models, it's really dominating much of our conversations. Um, it's, it's everywhere we look, which makes it perfect for this type of project, documentary theater. What will the world look like in 10 years? or maybe even just two. It's a question that's on many people's mind. So we set out to document with some voices. Most of us are already dependent on predictive AI in ways that we don't always think about, these ways that become kind of hidden and, and part of our daily lives. Our GPS maps are probably the best example. Our maps programs are working on algorithmic algorithms, constantly crunching real-time data traffic, road conditions, historical patterns, to predict the fastest route to our destination. It continuously analyzes factors, adjusting the route as needed. And we've become dependent on these tools. In fact, I often ponder or maybe threaten, uh, what would it be like to get rid of my cell phone, of my smartphone? Um, I have definitely a love-hate relationship with technology. But it's a loss of GPS that convinces me otherwise. How would I know where I was going? It's a kind of dependency, right? 
So ChatGPT works on the same principle. It predicts the best next word using tons of data from the internet. Thanks to complex neural networks that learn from patterns in text, as we rely more and more on these AI tools, we need to think about how to use them ethically and wisely. Our students have grappled with questions, big ones, like what are the ethical questions for using AI to co-write an essay? I mean, that's kind of where all this began, those headlines that said, this is the end of education as we know it, um, all of the fear of cheating. And that was kind of like the door into this and things are much bigger much bigger questions. Like, so what does it mean to co-author with ChatGPT? What are the lines we consider collaboration? Are those changing? How much of our humanity are we willing to outsource to technology? That became a driving question of this project. Which parts of our relationships, human face-to-face -face relationships are replaceable? Our creativity? Are things moving too fast? What's the need for legislation and oversight and the development of AI? How might we exercise our rights as citizens in this brave new world? Exploring these questions has helped students imagine the growing impact of AI on their lives. With AI systems becoming more sophisticated at lightning speed, it's crucial to stay informed about the pros and cons to make well-informed decisions to help shape a future where technology serves humanity and in enriching ways. So now the performances. You're about to see about a dozen monologues in tonight's presentation. It's important that we remind you this is just a small section of this project, just a little selection of the work. Across the five freshman classes, there were a total of 141 monologues which we watched and celebrated in class together. So everybody had a chance to shine in this project. So this performance is a select group, but it really is a tribute to the entire freshman class's hard work. This was a challenging and for some kids, very scary project to get up in front of everybody and perform. We have some very new performers here. Um, so congratulations to all 141 of them. And remind, just a reminder, you're seeing a snapshot of the work. So first up, I'm thrilled to uh, introduce our first performer. Uh, Kai Renmark Stewart is performing Eva Lena, a visual artist from Mandal, Sweden. Kai describes his interview subject as a fast talker, sitting on a red couch, backlit by the warm midday sun. Take it away, Kai. I think that AI is a technology. And it will change most everything that we do, almost everything that we use, and how we see the world. And that part of AI uh, is um, kind of the part that is a stumbling block for me, because I don't think we know what we want from it yet. I think that there's a lot of separate threads of different people trying to develop this technology and figure out what it is. But I don't necessarily think that there's some kind of end goal in mind. And I think that can get a little dangerous. The idea is if you're teaching a machine to learn, then how do you create a plan? If the AI starts going in a direction that you're not liking anymore, how do you change the path? Because it, it's so widespread and there's almost no way to stop it now. So how do you make sure that the end result isn't something that you hadn't intended? I think that there is a potential for AI to solve things that we don't seem to know how to solve yet. Like, for example, our climate crisis that we're dealing with. That would be an amazing thing if AI was able to solve it. But at the same time, if we're programming something to say, okay, well, we want you to learn how to solve the climate crisis. Well, the first thing that's going to go, potentially, is humans. Because we are the cause of it. If we're asking AI to solve the climate crisis, that is the first step it would take. It's crazy. I, I can't even, like... That is the first step we take. It's like, how do we program something to come with solutions that will not eventually lead to that solution? Like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, is that, yeah. It's kind of scary how fast AI is developing. Like, is that going to make it so that there are certain things that we stop doing as a human race? Some people are saying, oh, well, AI will take over certain jobs. And then those human workers will become useless. And then we'll have a whole class of people that 
don't actually have to work for a living. Yeah, they'll just have a basic stipend to live and they'll be on virtual reality headsets all day, you know, exploring. Maybe it'll be something useful. Maybe these non-workers will have some sort of daily task to complete, but maybe it won't be something useful. Maybe there's just a whole swath of society that doesn't really have a spe specific purpose. And the jobs that will remain are for people who are like, I like that, but not that. I like this, but not that. But that's already happening kind of in a way. Like there are these people on the internet, uh, tastemakers, also influencers is another term for them. But that's been going on for a long time. Like even before the internet, there was that one kid in high school who used to dress a certain way. Uh, yeah, so it's it's really a similar idea. It's these people who have a really strong idea of what is appealing and other people follow them because either there's some grain of truth to the truth to the appealing part or that person just has such a magnetic personality or whatever it is the reason that we humans do what we do. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's that's what I mean is that you don't necessarily foresee all of the results when you're first developing these technologies. Like with AI art, some people say AI is a tool, but it's not really a tool. It's more of a medium. AI is so much broader than just being a tool. Like one of the one interesting comparison I heard about this idea of AI being a medium as opposed to a tool was, okay, well, say you're hosting the Olympics and there's an AI robot that wants to compete in the Olympics alongside humans in the same category. Is that fair? No, right? AI in the future is going to be nearly impossible to compete with. So how do we compete? That's, that's the end. Thank you, Kai. Um, next up is Alaya Berkowitz, performing as her grandmother, Ellen Berkowitz who is passionate about dancing, but finds robot vacuums concerning. Take it away, Elia. Zadie's best friend has one. It vacuums where you want it to vacuum and, you know, does the whole, does the whole thing. I mean, Richard loves it. He, he loves it. I just, I wouldn't want something running around my house. Besides, I'd trip on it. I want to be able to vacuum the way I vacuum, you know, and, and do it the way I do it. And instead of having some machine do it for me, <laughs> I have control issues. I want to be able to control it. Every generation is different. And I, I don't think it's wrong. I mean, you're the third generation. You're, you're two times removed from me. It's normal. Yeah, normal. I couldn't do it, but... I mean, that doesn't mean you can't. I think in, in medicine, I think the doctors that work with it, it could be a big help. It could be really helpful. Besides, it would save lives, don't you think? I think the doctors and nurses in health, I think, I don't know for sure, but I think, but not in the arts, I would be very upset. Now, you don't want me to sing, but... If I could sing, you would want my real voice. So you can say, ooh, Rams, don't sing. <coughs> it's, like, it's like a laugh. You, you want a laugh to be real. So no, no art. I wouldn't want it to write a book either. I want it to come from an inner person, from an inner being. So no dancing, no writing. No, no art. I would be opposed to all that. Drawing, it's a, it's a talent. It's like if you sing, someone else's voice coming out of your, it's like someone else doing your dance steps. Emotion. It's emotion. It comes out of your inner being, your soul. And a chatbot isn't a soul. That alone, that, that, that alone is the key two words, artificial intelligence, with artificial being the prompt word.
Thanks a lot. That was fantastic. So next up is Bailey Hurley. And Bailey is, apologize for the technology here. We're, uh, Bailey's hand is up so we can spotlight Bailey. So Bailey is performing a very local um, character. Bailey's performing uh, as friend and classmate, Euphemia Ruff. Bailey describes their interview subject as having an optimistic point of view with lots of enthusiasm for the future. I love that. Take it away, Bailey. The first like AI I guess I encountered was like spell check because I'm like aggressively dyslexic. So it's just like, here's your spell check kid, like have fun, have fun with that. And in my opinion, like writing was never really all that important to begin with anyways. Like, there's so many other forms of communication that are much less, like, foolproof than AI. Like, and writing in general has always been, to me, like, never really something natural that was like, oh, you're, like, born to read and write, and I was like, no, thank you. And, you know, uh, I obviously don't want some, like, Ultron-looking ass, like, AI per monster creature, but I think like, like we already have to deal with kind of like evil people. So it's like, what's an evil robot, you know? Like, and it's also like, there's so many good tools with AI that it's like, why would you want to stop people? from being able to use tools that can like help them significantly. Like in terms of long, like long-term, I think it's definitely a positive just because like, for me, it just, for me, it was just like AI, like for as many jobs as it's like, for as many people getting put out of jobs, there's going to be people put into jobs with, the more new AI is made, the more like jobs and human resources that it needs. And so it's like, and so it's like the more, the more like resources and stuff that we have, like as a society, the faster we can progress and the faster we can find like n n new things and the faster we can like move forward as a society. I mean, like, there's, like, like, in the long run, no one's going to, like, like, in terms of big, big picture, no one cares if you know how to write. Like, no one cares if you know how to write, no one cares if you know how to read, like, that, it's stupid, it's arbitrary. We do need and should retain, like, the problem-solving skills that you get from, like, writing and reading and math, but, like, that we don't need it. Like, it's such a small thing and we don't need it. Thank you, Bailey. Um, up next is Amanda Vizuet performing as her older sister, Eliana Serrano, who is a college student studying social work. And when Amanda's pulled up, perfect, awesome. Take it away, Amanda. I feel that uh, children need that human interaction. I feel that it is soothing for them to know that a social worker is helping them or with adopted families too. I think if uh, we replace those conversations with artificial intelligence, it, I don't think it will allow for us to build human relationships and to be able to communicate effectively. I think it would actually be a barrier. Um, so hopefully in the field of social work, artificial intelligence won't take over. I do think um, social workers allow for better interaction when they are face-to-face -face with that person and not just robots to have those conversations. Um, well, I think it could be dangerous to use. It allows them to depend too much on technology 
and not really think about how to use their critical thinking skills and um, not really know how to solve problems. Um, instead, it replaces that with artificial intelligence. In the future, they're not going to know how to solve problems on their own, and um, they're going to depend too much on um, on uh, basically a robot, um, a machine that that stimulates human intelligence. Um, so I think it could be very dangerous to use. Youth should be able to uh, problem solve because if not, then robots or machines will take over one's mind. And I mean, who who's who is the one like creating this? You know, why? Who is benefiting from it? Why are they allowing it for machines to take over and not allowing the future generations to create these solutions on their own? Um, nowadays, they're aren't a lot of people, um, not a lot of people in the social work field. And when there is, um, they carry a lot of cases. Sometimes the ratio isn't enough for social workers to um, have that one-on-one -on -one connection with their clients. Um, so if let's say artificial intelligence were to have an impact in the social work field, I do think that um, it could allow for social workers to not carry as many cases as they would have. Um, uh, I don't know um, if it'll be some type of technology where uh, a computer will have those interactions with the clients. Um, but for now, I don't really foresee that happening because as social workers, especially in the child welfare system, you have to go and investigate if the child is in danger, if the child is safe in their home. And I don't think an AI machine would be able to do that. I think it has to be social workers. Um, unless it has something to do with writing reports um, for children, that could be a possibility. Um, the pros would be um, less time consuming. Um, social workers won't have as many cases. And the cons would be less imagination and creativity, um, not having one-on-one -on -one communication with clients um, and children and building relationships. Thank you, Amanda. We've talked a lot in class about uh, impact on industries and jobs. Uh, what some people are calling technological unemployment. Um, we've talked about how things will shift and some jobs will actually disappear. Some, some things will change. Um, so these voices that bring that to the forefront, um, really valuable part of the conversation. So next up is Rain Anderson. And Rain is going to be performing a monologue titled From a Child to Intelligence. Uh, and the, her subject was Seth Kynes. Kimes. Rain describes her interview subject as so interested and knowledgeable about AI that he could talk for hours. Take it away, Rain. Throughout American history, throughout human history, if people want to cause harm, they're going to cause harm. And trying and ensuring that people are protected from that is the duty of any software engineer. Any engineer, really. The first thing an engineer learns in school is engineering ethics, which is you are not allowed to do something if you know it could cause harm to others. And that's period. I think engineering is the essence of creating and building a new world for the next generation to be better. And, and how do I do that? I think AI is all of the above, positive, negative, and all the in-betweens. AI or ChatGPT, they're, they're more broadband, which means they learn on whatever information they come upon. They can learn and they can change the way they do things. But how much of it is actual creation and how much of it is just taking other information in and just regurgitating it? For example, there was an author who had AI create artwork for a book or whatever. Okay, well, whose creation is it? Did the AI create it or did she create it even though all she did was create the initial instruction? So. 
at what point is it assisting humanity to just making us become more lazy? AI has only been around for a very short period of time. It's, it's a child. It has the logic of maybe a two or four year old making assumptions on race, color, and all sorts of different things. Unconscious bias. I think anything a human creates is gonna have some sort of bias. I think, I don't think, in some ways, I don't think you can completely eliminate bias. Clearly I have questions for the programmers. I think it's a wonderful tool and has great capability, but, but it really depends on the intent of how you use it. Being a human living in a world with artificial intelligence means I have to make a conscious choice to choose to do better personally rather than have the tool do it for me. Um, it means I have to do my work both work, personally, familial, scholastic, because, because why I am on this planet in my belief is to do the work the best that I'm able to and contribute what I can to better humanity. And, and there are tools to help me do that. But if I'm letting the tool do it for me rather than having the tool in my hand to govern it, I think, I think that's a critical perspective to hold on to. It's what can I do with it rather than what can it do for me? Hi, thank you, Rain. Next up is Zoe French, who is performing as Arno Grunberg, a French science fiction filmmaker and collector in Paris. Zoe describes her subject as sitting in his Paris apartment, slurring the harsh lines of English while describing his complicated relationship with AI. Take it away, Zoe. 10 years ago in Paris, there was a show at the Japan Consulate and they brought one of the very first uh, Asimo robots. And uh, Asimo, as you know, is named in honor of uh, Asimov. But uh, Asimo, it may have been 15 years ago now, as you know, is a human robot. It's a, it's a made like a human. It's, a, it's quite tall, it's maybe five feet tall. And uh, I remember being in the audience and for the first time as a science fiction a reader and enthusiast, I remember for the first time, I was actually in the presence of a real robot and I didn't like the experience. For some very strange reason, it was pure feeling. Just being in the presence of that thing, I felt threatened. I didn't feel physically threatened. That thing was not going to go berserk and attack people. No, it's just that it's mere existence. I felt threatened to me as a member of a species, which is very, very strange. That thing was just walking. But just because it was walking like a human and it was a fairly big machine and you know, five feet tall machine like that weighs at least 225 pounds. But uh, that was not what, what scared me. So that was that. And then on the other hand, you have the recent progress of AI. And when you combine the two, you may end up with R2D2, but uh, you may end up with a Terminator as well. It's just like, do we really need this? You know, What's making the progress of AI worse is that it's out of the lab. It's actually already out of the lab. That thing, it's in our everyday lives through the internet. And these inventions in themselves are incredible inventions. And they are the, the results. They're the, the progress of thousands and thousands of years of progress in the sciences. And uh, they really are just in incredible inventions. But at some point, we need to, to decide or make up our minds whether they are beneficial or not. It's just a matter of balance. And I'm not a fan of the internet. I am old enough. It uh, came up very, very quickly. But um, I actually feel the internet has made our lives uh, really poor in many, many ways. It's, you know it's going to affect your lives. You know it's going to affect millions and millions of people's lives. And there's no control. We just need to make them safe machines to be around if we really need them. I mean, we have machines everywhere around us and we, they, we've, we have them for a long time. But um, they have been, I would say, uh, uh, limited to a special work and a special environment in the presence of uh, people who know how to use them. I'm not saying the bad things are necessarily going to happen, but uh, is it worth the risk, really? I don't know. I don't think so.
Thank you, Zoe. So next up is Isabella Ruder Zilber performing as Lincoln Schlensky. Lincoln is a professor of film, history, and literature from British Columbia. In this monologue titled Complicated Questions, Isabella describes how Schlensky regularly connects seemingly unrelated topics, using them as metaphors and bringing in details related to his classes to discuss the implications of artificial intelligence. Take it away, Isabella. There's a lot going on with AI and there's a lot of potential for things that, you know, we really can't quite yet conceive of. More obvious case to make. You know, film is a highly technological product. It requires intense um, uh, editing, and every shot, every scene is not as natural as it often appears to us when we're in a cinema. And that's the whole trick that Hollywood loves, right? It's the disguising of the means of production. It's the disguising of the apparatus that has produced this. And therefore, in an almost metaphorical way, a disguising of the um, the intent that went into creating this product in the first place. And yes, it's a product. It's a commercial product. It's also an artistic product as it happens, but it's a commercial product as well. And so, you know, much like this new technology that we, um, you know, loosely categorize under the heading of AI, there's a lot going on in the background that is not obvious to the human eye. You know, you think of Plato, I think it was Plato. You know, Plato was, he, he was, he really felt that, you know, poets did not have a place in the democratic republic because poetry is a kind of, you know, playing with words. It was bringing in all sorts of artifice and he was worried about that artifice. Well, AI is another artifice. It's not one that we necessarily understand very well, but it's complicated in much the same way all artifice is complicated. Um, it's, it's artificial and it's constructed and very, very often does not reveal the nature of the construction that went into creating it. Again, you know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the great enlightenment philosopher, he was very concerned about theater. And so was Denis Diderot, you know, another enlightenment philosopher. And they had these, these tremendous arguments in the 18th century about the potential threat of something like theater. And well, Diderot argues that while well, actors are inherently dangerous to democratic societies because they go up on stage and suddenly they're someone who they're not. They're not really. They go up on stage and suddenly they're putting on an act. And not only are they putting on an act, so you don't even know what they really think, but they're also attracting loyal followers, fans in those days. They didn't use those terms, but basically what we call fans today. And he believed that this would inherently corrupt the society that permitted it. So that's a kind of, you know, absolutist perspective on the dangers of artifice and technology as a kind of artifice. And I don't think that very many people do agree with that perspective. That was also Plato's perspective regarding poets. But you can understand where those ideas came from. You know, the major rule of classical Hollywood film production is make sure that your camera work and everything about the scene you're producing is as unobtrusive as possible, right? You don't see the apparatus in the background. You don't see the camera shifting its focus or shifting its position or an edit happening. You don't see it because it's become so naturalized. So I think that this is potentially the biggest threat in the realm that we're speaking of this AI, that, that it will become so embedded in the ways we do things that it almost becomes naturalized. And we stop asking those questions about what those sources are and how they've been put together and you know what possible conclusions might've been drawn from those sources or from others. And, one way that that threat can be mitigated is, is by making very clear how the product has been produced, showing the framework, showing the means of production, showing the apparatus, and as much as possible, showing how certain ideas were arrived at. And that's, that, that's an ethos of scholarship already. That's, that's long been an ethos of scholarship. But um, 
those kinds of questions are very hard. It's very difficult to show apparatus, especially when that apparatus is enormously difficult. It's very difficult to say, well, this answer might have been drawn from these. Maybe it's five texts. Maybe it's 50 texts. Maybe it's thousands of texts. You know, who knows? And as the chat models become more and more sophisticated, they'll likely be drawing on more and more sources at once. And this is a very difficult thing not only to show, but for the average user to understand. So even if it were able to show all of its sources, would we be able to understand it? That's a complicated question too, I think. Wonderful job, Isabella. So next up, our performer is Lucia Coleman, performing as Peter Coleman, a post-anesthesia care unit nurse, or PACU, um, of 13 years. So Lucia describes her interview subject as a father of two daughters who has received the Patient Choice Daisy Award twice in his career. Take it away, Lucia. Artificial intelligence to me is, I would say, computers that can characterize human understanding and what we're going to think next. Is AI a positive change? I don't know. It's computer-driven information, and by answering yes or no to certain questions or political learnings, the AI figures out exactly what kind of ads to target you with. I see it all the time on, like, Facebook and things. Corporations and capitalists making money off the population instead of actually helping people. That's kind of how I feel about AI. I think it's just going a little bit too far, a little bit too fast. I've been a nurse for about 13 years and I work in the post anesthesia care unit. We do mostly planned surgeries. In my eyes, we've gone mostly away from paper charting to more of an electronic charting system that's shared across multiple platforms. It's helpful for when patients end up in different hospitals. I think that's probably the biggest one. You'll also see telehealth in different things for more rural populations who don't live near any doctors. That way, you can still get specialized help in emergency situations. And that's really helped nurses and doctors create specialized care for different people, saving people from all the way from Africa to Iowa. I don't know if AI will ever actually be effective at waking up a person and talking to them and being there for them and caring for them because every patient wakes up differently depending on the type of anesthesia used. So I guess the AI could learn that, but some people wake up fighting, some people wake up crying and some people wake up refreshed. But in my eyes, there's really no way to get around the human part of it. I don't know if AI will ever really take a leadership role when it comes to medicine, but I have a feeling it could help out insurance companies when it comes to billing and situational things by following its know-how of the doctor's clinical pathway. When it comes to a doctor deviating from a clinical pathway and creating a whole new like solution for a patient who has different needs, the insurance sometimes doesn't cover that. And I think that could be possibly because the AI, that's not what its clinical know-how is. It's programmed to decide what's refunded and not refunded, what we pay and what we don't pay. And that's good for my job. But in my perspective, I think when it comes to working with an actual person, that needs to be slowed down a little bit. And thank you, Lucia. Next up is Amanda. Amanda King is going to be performing uh, Mixiel Laufer, a former mathematician and the founder of the Four Thieves Vinegar Collective. Amanda describes her interview subject as talking energetically and sometimes sassily about AI's impact on art and the economy. Take it away, Amanda. There'll never be a lack of need for artists. And they'll never be, you know, the craft changes. 
And in a similar way, right, this conversation that's currently happening surrounding AI with art has happened. Many times in the past, there have been these similar watershed moments. Like when photography came out, every artist freaked out. And you know, you see it in the, in the literature of the times. They were to cry, oh my God, painters, yada, yada. But paint hasn't gone anywhere, you know, that's still a thing. In my mind, the differentiation here is between artistic expression and like craft, right? So you can find people who are very good at painting in oil or taking photographs or working with Photoshop or, or now working with AI. But there are, but there are these two things that are similar and they sort of run parallel, but we often conflate them. And those are, do you have, do you have the skill to the requisite skill? Like enough skill in any medium, like music or dance or, or paint or Photoshop or AI whispering in order to be able to create what you're imagining. But there's this other question, which is, do you have something to say? Everybody likes pretty things, but there's a drastic difference between, oh, I made something that's visually pleasing and I utilize the medium of visual representation to express something. So, so I think that for the most part, the people who are concerned with this are the people who are concerned with art, right? Or craft. They've, they've worked really hard to get good at Photoshop and like, that's a hard thing to do. And that skill set is being adjusted and supplanted to some degree. But, but that's just craft and so cool. They're gonna have to learn a new tool because there's a new tool in the toolbox, but nothing will ever threaten artists because art, unlike craft, is having thoughts, having feelings, and finding ways to package those. So again, it's the same sort of thing. And, you know, we've heard this story plenty of times and it'll be interesting to see what happens. But it's not, it's not, it's not like it threatens anybody, really. Wonderful job, Amanda. I am very excited to bring up our next performer, Gio Castillo Rodriguez, who is also performing as someone a little bit closer to home, a fellow uh, robotics team member. So Gio describes his subject as a member of the robotics leadership team here at Credo and performing as Brian Neistat. Take it away, Gio. Um, I don't know. As long as I can remember, there's always been some mention of Venom, one way or another. And how we define it's always changing. Like we go, that's AI. And then what we consider the leading edge of AI gets more and more advanced. And we realize that was just a relatively simple set of rules. And um, it's always this thing. So like, as long as I can remember. Um, I mean, when I first encountered it, like used to myself, I don't know. I mean, I'd heard about ChatGPT. Um, I'd heard about a little bit and just kind of on the whim decided to step in the account and play with it. And um, like, uh, how do I say this? Don't read this the wrong way, but um, I mainly use it for entertainment. Like I've seen some people post some funny things on Twitter and Reddit. And those are the main places, but um, like there's this one person, um, I don't remember the off top of my head, but more along the lines, they had instructed it to um, instruct someone how to take a peanut butter and jelly sandwich out of the VCR in the style of the King James Bible. And that was an hilarious read. But where I've mixed feelings on it is when they tried to use it to replace people. Like there's this particular case, there's this uh, tech news website and they've been around for a while and were kind of known to cover tech and news. And they had recently been exposed for having used ChatGPT in their article because some people saw that they made a very simple mistake. Like instead of saying you gained an extra 30%, it would say you gained an extra 130%. And um, 
some people looked at that and said, that's a mistake an AI would make. And there's this whole investigation and it was this whole thing, but um, I don't know. I have mixed feelings because I definitely see reasons for it, but I also see reasons against it. And you can't write out all the ifs and buts as, or just say, be reasonable as much sense as that would make in one or two people's head or something. And thank you, Gio. Next up, we have Lucas Hess. And Lucas is performing Leandros uh, Tassilus. is a professor of en electrical engineering at Yale. And I do have to say briefly, uh, tell you the story of Lucas's interview. Uh, Lucas uh, reached out to the president of Yale and uh, and asked for an interview and the president responded with uh, that he wasn't an expert, but, uh, but he could give him a list of experts. So Leandros is a professor of electrical engineering at Yale. Uh, his main field of study is communication networks and mathematical models and algorithms. Lucas describes his subjects many accolades, including the Distinguished Alumni Award at the University of Maryland, and the IFIP Networking 25 Best Paper Award. Take it away, Lucas. Certainly there is some danger with the way that AI evolved, especially in the last couple of years. It was, I should say, surprising, even for the researchers in that area. So there's definitely a lot to think about, but it also reveals its great potential. Very recently, we've seen very important progress on the, let's say, interactive AI and AI that can converse in a human level in terms of intelligent conversation. There are multiple fronts in which AI is progressing. Um, for instance, a few years ago, there could have been important progress on using AI for addressing important scientific challenges, such as problems in physics. So I think we're gonna see a lot, of, a lot more of that nowadays. The next important advance that I think is coming is the incorporation of intelligence in robotics and inside physical systems. So we're going to see intelligent behavior being exhibited in systems that can interact with the physical environment. It's also a great tool for sorting all the human genome related data and sorting out all the DNA matches and the genome material for use in personalized medicine. More recently, there's been uh, an, an important advance in using AI for, uh, for predicting the three-dimensional structure of proteins. And this has been the holy grail of biochemistry for several decades now. And it's opened up the door for a whole new generation of pharmaceuticals. For every new innovation that humankind comes up with, it has its dangers and it has its uh, it has its benefits. So I think it really is up to us to take advantage of the benefits and alleviate possible negative repercussions. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, next up, we have another um, local performance, um, but the only one tonight who is uh, both performer and being performed. Um, so next up is Dakota Bowman, who's performing Giovanni Rodriguez. And Giovanni is uh, a freshman at Credo. He's also a programmer and a musician. Take it away. Well, I consider my experience with AI to be one hour in the middle of the night coding because I was lonely on Valentine's Day, but it was pretty fun. Yeah, that's all I can say about that. I was like, wow, machine learning is like something that really interests me, you know, because machines can do so much. Talking about, I can talk about machines and learning forever, but simply down, machines do cool things that I find cool. So I decided that I wanted to make machines. Now, what really interests me is AI on the emotional side, because if we give AI emotions, does that mean that we have to give them rights? Because AI is programmed to be perfect. So if we somehow make a human, that, that means that those futures can totally change the tech we have. And I, I don't think it's AI that's a big problem. I think that humans are taking advantage of AI because people now just have the power to destroy anyone. And I do think that's a big problem. 
but AI, if we make if we give if we make them human, then what makes them different than us? If we give them thoughts, if they have free will, then what we're doing, if we make them work, it's basically slavery. A robot tries to destroy humanity, basically, right? I don't think AI can do that alone, but humans can, definitely. So it's really about how much power that we give to these AIs that we give to us. And I think the big thing with AI is that it would, is that it would have to remember. Yeah, and that's scary. If we make AI remember stuff, well, it would make it learn, but we could totally ruin ourselves. But personally, I believe that AI can never really create creativity. You know, you can like program an AI to be like, oh, this sounds good or this looks good, but not on the links of humans, you know? So I think that leaves us humans to be able to do what we're really good at, which is creativity, which is like passion, you know? Because AI has never, because information has never been this, what's it called? Easy. Thank you, Dakota. So up next, we have Addie Bleasdale, who is performing as a former associate director of the Humanity-Centered Robotics Initiative at Brown University named Peter Haas. In the monologue titled, Drowning in Our Comfort, Haas focuses on the ex existential questions raised by this growing technology. Take it away, Addie. Um, so the future is coming much faster than um, back in the teens uh, for when artificial general intelligence was coming out are totally and completely off base. Like the things that we thought were coming out like 50 years or 30 years out, you're really, you're looking at more like 10 years out or five years out. Like things are progressing very fast. Um, I gave a talk about five years ago about mainly the real reason to fear artificial intelligence. And it, it, uh, it really had to do with people, people trusting AI. And I think that's really still an issue. I mean, because if you look at some of the results that come out of chat GPT-4, for example, are just total garbage. They're total fabrication. And it's just like, oh, so what's the point of asking this large language model anything if everything that comes out of it, you have to fact check, right? But I mean, just, just as much as that's an issue, I think it's time that we amend that, um, that talk and to say that there might be bigger reasons to actually fear AI. And as much like, I mean, there is per se, there is the potential for AI and robotics being able to solve problems that we like large problems that we can't be able to solve on our own. Like if you were to take climate change, for example, right? Like big, big problem. Um, like maybe robots planting trees or something or robots growing aquatic plants or something is that is going to be able to sequester enough CO2, right? To get us out of that problem. Like maybe robots cleaning up plastic waste is going to stop like the Pacific gyre from being a problem. Like, so yeah, I mean, there really, there is the potential for AI to be able to solve some of these big problems like problem solving. But I mean, I, I look at some of the research and applications now, right? And 
it's <laughs> it's like we're risking everything to make a robot that does the dishes better than a dishwasher. I just um gosh, I I really I feel like we we're really coming into this point in time where we're we're having this big opportunity where we're giving our autonomy away and over to AI, right? And it's going to be really bad for us in the long run. I mean, it's it's difficult, right? It's 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 really hard. We have this totally and completely alien intelligence, right? It's not going to function the same way that we function by any stretch of the imagination. It's not going to have an endocrine system. It's not going to have hormonal swings or emotions and such. Like all of these things that are so innately human will be absent, right? So I just, I feel, I feel like it really, it misses, it misses the essence of humanity, right? Like it misses, it misses all of these good and all of the wonderful things about being human. Like all of these things that really don't get attention in the, um, the, the corpus of literature, right? So with that, we have to think about, oh, what are we really building for one? And then how is that compatible with the human experience? So yeah, that's the kicker, <laughs> kicker of a question. Thank you, Addy. That was wonderful. The essence of humanity. That is the kicker in this debate. Uh, next up is going to be our first pre recorded video. And this is Emma Guilford, who's performing an AI ethicist named Olivia Gambelli. As CEO and founder of Ethical Intelligence, Gambelli works directly with business leaders to develop responsible models of AI. So let's run the video. So I grew up outside of San Francisco. So it was like everyone was using technology. Everyone was obsessed with the newest technology. Um, I guess when you grow up in that kind of area, it's very nerdy. You're like, what, what new technology are you using? Um, but now I had studied ethics. I loved ethics. I thought it was a fascinating field. It's kind of like how, you know, scientists like physicists will study physics because it's, they like to understand how the world works and the mechanics of it all. It's kind of like me with ethics. I like to study ethics because it's how I understand how people work in the world and how emotions work and why we do things. Um, so that's why I study ethics. And so then when I came across the conversation of ethics and AI, that was a connection for me where I was like, it's, I already find AI interesting. It's different types of technology. It's kind of cool. Um, so one of the analogies I use a lot is a compass. Um, cause what you're doing when you're applying ethics and AI is you're looking for alignment. You're aligning your decisions, you're aligning your actions, you're aligning everything to your values or to whatever values in existence that you're in alignment with. So I use the analogy a lot of a compass because what a compass does is it aligns you to the path you're supposed to take. Um, but the coolest part to me, actually, um, AI, we build AI how based off of how we think about our own intelligence, which is unique. You don't like build a software because you because it's kind of like how you think. It's more of like, I'm building, you know, you got chat GBT. We're building it so that it talks like a person. So there's a lot of questions around ethics of like, what does it mean to actually have emotions and think and have intelligence? What does that mean at all of it? Um, but I like to remain optimistic because I see the technology. It's like a tool. It's like another tool. 
our tech, like our laptop is a tool, our calculator is a tool, our tech and AI can also be a tool. Um, but the part that concerns me is if we ever lose respect for our own human nature. Um, meaning humans, we have a different type of intelligence that's not actually artificial intelligence. We have a lot more um, input receptors. We have more information that we process. We have different types of information that just is inaccessible to AI. Um, and AI will never be able to fully incorporate um but we as people actually have a great point in time where we can use ai to help us understand ourselves better i mean ai is processing information about us as people so it can give us different insights that are harder for us to see um doesn't mean we never see them ourselves um it just means like i can't process tens of millions of points of data in a split second versus I can use a tool to help me process tens of millions of data on me to learn more about myself um, or learn more about we how we as humans interact. Um, it's also, I'm excited and hopeful that as we progress in our technology, um, it forces us as people to have another, a new like self-awareness, a new understanding of like, this is what it means to be human or like this is a uh, what i'm good at or how i can creatively think because machines can't aren't creative they don't they don't have ideas they have information that we that we have given and we have humans have created and ideas that we have and then the machines use that idea but the machines themselves they don't create so I'm excited to see kind of like an artist where you're like in collaboration with a tool to see what you can create on the other end. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, I know you're watching, <laughs> even though it's a video, super awesome. Um, next is Elka Seward Katzmiller who's performing as somatic therapist, Wolven Seward Katzmiller. Elka describes Wolven as lively and full of character as she begins to speak about AI and its impact on the world of therapy. Take it away, Elka. So I have to use a big thick book called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. All therapists have to use. It's like, the book of diagnoses. And so when I think this person might have this thing, I often have to like take out the book and check. If instead of the book, I could be like, hey Siri, this client has blah, 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 blah. I think it's dysthymia, what do you think? And it was quicker, that'd be cool. But then there's risk of misdiagnosis. Like there are a lot of cultures where um they believe in spirits and they believe in like when someone's got anxiety or someone's having nightmares so they can't sleep. Um, take Latino culture, for example. They might believe that um, someone's been infected by a spirit and they might call it susto. And this person would need a limpia or a cleansing. And so in their culture, you would go and see a shaman who would do a limpia. And whereas if this person sits down with AI and tells, AI, I'm hearing voices. I think it's the spirit of my dead, blah, blah, blah. I think this is what's happening to me. AI is going to be like, oh, schizophrenia. That's not cool. You see, humans have done that too. Human therapists who have no cultural awareness have also ended up misdiagnosing people who are having what is considered a very normal philosophical approach to life, given their culture. I'm very much about the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. And that's got a lot of things, right? Beyond what you can see and what you can hear. Senses that can tell you whether or not someone's having a fight response or a flight response or a freeze response. I've trained myself to track my system. And my system is tracking faster than my brain can. So I might be having someone telling me about something really scary that happened to them or something that kind of caused them to shut down. And my heart might start pounding 
And so AI might try to have a camera looking at this person and all they might see is this, but inside that person's heart is pounding. And something about the way that they're presenting causes my heart to start picking up. And I'll be like, oh, this person is freaked out. Have you ever had that feeling in the store or on the bus somewhere, like someone's watching you, but you can't see it. You know, you can't, it's not like your eyes can see them. You just feel it. AI can't do that. How's AI going to do that? What I do, I'm fairly confident AI couldn't do. Maybe some therapists would feel like they have to compete, but I'm not, I have, I have like zero worries. A lot of people go to therapy for things they don't get from other humans. A lot of people didn't get the safety or attunement that they needed from their parents. And it kind of just snowballed in life. Can you imagine trying to get safety and attunement from a robot? I'd break that thing. I'd be like, Ugh! Thank you, Elka. And thank you for a fantastic last line. <laughs> uh, next up, and actually closing the show before our Q&A, uh, is Chloe Kamages. Um, she'll be performing Catlin Moore, who's a programmer, uh, a program manager at Meta, a company fully known as Facebook. In her monologue, she discusses how human biases can lead to biases in programming. Take it away, Chloe. Um, I think it encourages people on the design side of things to think more critically about how, um, even at the programming level for AI, we're trying to think about things like bias and inclusivity or exclusivity. And um, a really good example of that would be a lot of the early technology for self-driving cars. Um, when the people were first programming and relying on a heavy amount of AI in order to run them efficiently, uh, didn't accurately test the software on people with darker skin. So a lot of the cars weren't picking them up. And as a result, these accidents were happening. And it was because of that very human lens that was shadowed by this level of bias that the technology wasn't running in a way that's actually practical for our day-to-day -day experiences. So just because AI exists, I think there are a lot of interesting directions that we can take it but it doesn't necessarily eliminate a very human level of bias and prejudice that can be there at the programming level. Um, I've seen really great work on our side as far as things go with that, um, trying to be careful about that and trying to diversify um, who gets in the programming spaces um, to try to hold us accountable. And I just hope that becomes more of a practice in a lot of places uh, for people who are working with this technology. Um, I think the downsides are, the technology is moving faster than we recognize the consequences sometimes. Um, they don't realize that, you know, with every benefit, sometimes there are costs and you don't always know that until you're in it. Um, but I would also challenge that instead of replace, it's more about working harmony with or trying to help find ways to push the job in a new, new direction or push aspects of the work in a different direction. Um, as far as the work I do, I could see or like, I don't know, I would do program management. I'm a people manager. Um, I can maybe see a place for AI as I'm managing my team and getting feedback from clients where AI can maybe help craft a performance management plan for someone that needs a little extra support in certain spaces. Um, so it's interesting how, you know, one thing comes up, it could potentially open some other doors. But um, I also don't feel like there's really a reason to press the panic button yet just because the potential is so great. But of course, there are going to be things to figure out as we go. And with technology, it's always building the plane while we fly it to some degree. Thank you so much, Chloe. I love that last line to uh, close the show. Um, so let's give a virtual round of applause for our wonderful student of performers. Um, as their teachers, we feel beyond privileged to witness not only their insightful and thought-provoking performances, 
but also all of the different steps in the process. So tonight, when we do our brief Q&A, we want to highlight this multifaceted process that the students went through to complete this large scale project. Um, one, our students met this challenge head on. They used innovative approaches to research, um, write their interview questions, transcribe, shape the text that they were using, um, these transcriptions into a monologue, memorize that monologue, and then ultimately start making different acting choices that brought these characters to life that you just saw. Um, but before we open the floor to questions, uh, we wanna share just a short video with you that features one of our students, um, Brooklyn Antolini, and her very unique approach to memorizing uh, this monologue. So Eric's gonna take that away. I was thinking that I'm going to blow your mind. I was thinking back to something Aristotle said, which is essentially the summation of, you give me a boy and I'll give you a man. What Aristotle really said is you give me a youth of seven and I'll give you the foundations of a man. In other words, early on in life as humans, our environment, parents, and influences have a long lasting effect on us, which we carry throughout our lifetime. Now think of AI. AI is a baby. Now think about how smart it is. It is, and if its parents teach it right, from a morality perspective, from a human's rights perspective, from a respect perspective, looking out for good, not bad, then it could be used, be used in a very powerful, meaningful, good way. However, like you said, if the influences are biased, racist, negative, exploitive, or in, and or extremely dangerous, that's where I'm thinking the interaction between humans and the future of AI becomes extremely critical. People who are good typically have confidence that the system works. People who are bad constantly want to try to exploit you and are very vigorous and dedicated to that very evil perspective. I, I love that. Um, it is like, actually, I, I, the first words I said to Brooklyn when I saw it was, that is delightfully insane. Um, so really, you know, a wonderful eccentric process in preparing. So we have some time for question and answer and would love to uh, hear from the audience. Can we um, bring our students, student performers, can you uh, turn your cameras back on? You don't have to turn your mics on quite yet until you accept a question. There's a, um, Ms. Ackman Collins, is there a question feature um, or do we have to put, um, are we just gonna put questions into the chat? It'll be or chat. if somebody wants to raise a hand for a question, perhaps? Uh, chat will be the easiest. Okay. That'll, that'll, yeah, I think that'll be the most efficient. Okay, great. Let's start them coming. If you've got questions for our performers, any aspect of what you saw, the content, the process, uh, please drop them into the chat. And also some shout outs. Um, We have a very quiet group this year. <laughs> Maybe we're shy or we're not sure how the chat function works. So, <laughs> um, okay, cool. We're getting some questions. Great. Um, how did you choose who to interview? What was your main motivation? Um, and mixed into that, I think, is the next question, which is a uh, process of finding uh, interviews. But were you intimidated? What was it like to interview these people? So anyone who would like to pick that up, what was it like finding your subject? How did you pick your subject? Um, or just the process of putting this together? Um, I see Addie's hand up. We maybe can use the, the hand too, but um, whatever that raised hand, there we go. 
and I will step back. Ms. Hockman Collins, maybe if we could uh, highlight one of the spotlight, one of the students. Yeah, there we go. Um, I would say for me, like the um, process of finding the person I interviewed was um, my mom has a lot of connections in um, like the film industry due to her job. And when I told her about the project, she was like, oh, Zoe, I have this friend who lives in Paris and he worked on Star Wars closely with George Lucas. And I think that he would be perfect. And I was a little skeptical at first, but I did a little research on him and um, I thought, okay, I'll give it a try. And um, it was a little awkward at first emailing with him. I was definitely intimidated because he was like some old guy I'd never met before who lived in a different country. Um, and um, my mom was like, no, no, sorry, don't worry. He's like super nice. You're going to love it. And so we like um, scheduled a Zoom meeting and he was like really nice. And he talked forever. And I had like the limited Zoom and he talked until the very end of the Zoom meeting and Zoom basically mm -hmm. cut him off. And he was just super sweet. Um, and yeah, he was not intimidated at all about from me. And I was not intimidated by him at all as soon as I met him. Thank you, Zoe. Um, maybe we can bring Addie up. Um, and then Gio. Yeah. Okay. So I would say um, there was certainly a process to finding my person. I had had like different possible people lined up, but then I had talked to Dr. Gordon and he had recommended um, Peter Haas, who I who works with the humanitarian initiative at Brown, who used to work there, associate director. Um, well, speaking to the intimidated question, though, I would say that at the beginning, I was probably definitely intimidated a bit, like choosing out interview questions was kind of a process because I really didn't want to like offend him or dig too deep in some way or more. So um, that was a process, but then I think once I met him and got comfortable in the interview, then it was pretty good, but yeah. Thank you, Addie. Um, and I see in the, the chat right now, I'm thinking of Anna DeVere Smith, a performance artist who specializes in performing interviews. And the students actually studied the work of Anna DeVere Smith for this project. Uh, and looked at a little bit of kind of the, the scope of, um, of documentary theater in, uh, in the United States. Um, so Anna DeVere Smith was actually was a very important model. Thank you for that, Lincoln. Gio. Uh, for the interview question for me, it was uh, thinking about someone who I kind of knew, but also like had like a bunch of knowledge on that. And me and Brian are on the robotics team and had conversation, so many conversations about like AI and stuff. And I just kind of want to get like maybe someone who's more experienced, but also younger to like get their perspective. And I was intimidated, but it was also a little bit less because it was a friend. Nice. Thank you, Gio. Um, I'm going to bring up the second part of Lincoln's question which uh, goes, um, talking about Anna DeVere Smith, um, she goes through a, uh, an intense process of becoming another. Did anyone find themselves, uh, let's see, where is it? Did you find yourself as actors becoming your interview? Maybe someone could talk about that. What was it like to transform into another person? You know, it's, what was that? process like? Were there places where you really kind of felt like you embodied? Anyone want to speak to that? Amanda. Um, well, um, I interviewed my older sister and, um, you know, as uh, a younger sister, I have always looked up to her. So um, I guess trying to be her in some type of way was, um, um, I try to view things um, in a different perspective because me and her have different mindsets. And um, 
it was something different because she was a more confident and she was someone who always had a clear understanding and always had opinion on something, which for me, I didn't have that. So I really did get into character with her because um, um, she was, um, I guess, in, a, in some type of way, she was, she had um, similar characteristics. Um, um, and I just took that and I, um, from the years that I've been with her, um, I've just picked up from what I know of her. And that's how mm -hmm. I became her. Thank you, Amanda. One of the things we said over and over in the question in the classroom was find the rhythm of the language of, of your subject, uh, because uh, they, they, I mean, there is a there's a linguistic component to this project, listening to the way that people speak, hearing a natural rhythm and sometimes even the poetry of our off the cuff casual spoken language. Uh, oh, we have another question in here from uh, Eva Lena about uh, uh, where next with AI? Um, are you inspired to research more, to learn more, um, or even open that up a little more to where do you stand with AI right now in your life going forward? Uh, Geo. Uh, hello. Uh, I am very much inspired to keep researching AI because I don't know, I just find this concept so cool. Like you can teach a machine to like do things that for so long we thought were just truly human. And uh, of course, I'm also a little bit scared of it, but ultimately I do wanna, you know, see what there is and how to do it. Fantastic. We're, I realize we're running a little later than we thought we would. Um, so maybe we'll just, uh, we will wrap up. Um, and I, I just want to say again, well, thank you all for coming. We, we had a glitch with um, our technology. So we had a limited capacity. We have recorded this. We're going to post it and send it out to everyone. But really what I'd like to do is say another big round of applause. Maybe if you guys can light up that uh, the, the chat feature with some comments, some shout outs, and, and thank you to everyone who performed here. There was some real bravery in that, and, and what you shared was valuable and wonderful. Yeah, I'd love to see that going. See all those claps you guys are getting? Really nice. Yeah, very proud of you all. And very proud of the whole ninth grade and really seeing uh, uh, what everyone did to push themselves a little bit out of their comfort zone um, in many ways, you know, as a performer, um, as an interviewer, and probably intellectually as well, learning about so many new concepts. Um, so thank you all. Thank you for coming. I'd like to give one last shout out um, to Ms. Achman Collins, who's behind the scenes in all of this, um, but also bigger than just this, um, who's behind the scenes at, at Credo. And uh, Credo really is, you know, I find it to be a remarkable school that creates a space for this kind of work. To happen because this wouldn't happen at, at so many schools, at most schools in this country. Um, and so I, I feel very privileged to work at Credo and to be a part of this. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Upton Collins, and thanks to you all. Thank you, everyone. And thank you. I saw a lot of subjects, interview subjects here. So thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Have a great night, you guys. Take care.